uh, you know, I think of the phrase that MLK used, the fierce urgency of now. Mm -hmm. what, what, again, you're right, we might not survive in a world, essentially, in which white Americans are unwilling or incapable of confronting this concept of whiteness right. and, and acknowledging the truth and the realities that black and brown Americans see every day. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Look, um, you know, many white brothers and sisters, perhaps even present here tonight, uh, just a little bit under the skin, subcutaneous reaction of being seen as a group. How dare you? Mm -hmm. They have had the luxury of being individuals. Black folk don't know nothing about that. <laughs> Right, we all part of the group. If one of y'all did it, all of y'all did it. Mm -hmm. That's why we pray when it's somebody on TV, please don't let it be a black man, please. <laughs> Just please, not this time. Just don't let it be Bobo or Willie, please. <laughs> right, no disrespect, Jose, take some of the blame. Then Latinos are like, don't let it be a Latino. Let it be a black guy. <laughs> then all of us together, let it be a white guy <laughs> with a buzz cut from Nebraska. Yes! <laughs> right? So the way in which we, have, we are born into an almost intrinsic conception of collectivity, that we can never be judged as an individual, that even when we are seen as an individual, we are seen as an exception to, not representative of. The bad things that black people do are seen as representative of the group. The great things we do are seen as exceptions to the group. So we never get the, the balance right. And many white brothers and sisters are used to thinking themselves not as white, but as human beings. What a luxury. What a beautiful thing. You don't even see your whiteness. That's great. We see it. And what's interesting is that on the one hand, there's an edifying conception of a certain kind of indifference to ethnicity or race. It's beautiful, but on the other hand, it's real dangerous. Because when you have it and you don't know it and you do stuff with it, it can be real problematic if you don't know how to handle it. Right, you think you got a toy gun, but you got a Winchester. You know, okay, that's John Wayne-like, but you, you know what I'm saying, a Glock. Let me be more contemporary, NRA, what's up? So what's interesting is that, that if you deploy whiteness without knowing you're deploying it, it's problematic. And many white brothers and sisters do not want to be called together to account, even metaphysically or metaphorically, as a group. White America is a trope. I knew, you know, I was on the radio early, and why are you calling us white? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Caucasoid? I mean, I could, I could come up with a non-black, non-brown, non-red, non-yellow, right? Um, you know, why, why see us all together? I understand that. I understand that rebellion. But the reality is it's a, it's a shorthand. It's, a, it's a, a way of engaging a group of people that we know you have diversities and differences and contradictions many of which are not ascribed to African-American people when the shoe is on the other foot or the tongue is on the other side of the cheek. The reality is um, that white Americans have not been invited and engaged to think self-critically and introspectively about what it means to be white. When we think like men, men think gender. Oh, that's a bunch of women. No, you have a gender too, sir. You're a man. Masculinity can be toxic, we learned, right? You can grab things. You can be predatory. Your misogyny, sexism, and, and, and patriarchy can combine to be lethally intense against vulnerable bodies. So w men don't think about gender in regard to themselves, and white brothers and sisters don't think about race in regard to themselves. You've got a race too, right? Ethnicity is one thing. No, I'm, you know, if we bring anything, I'm Italian or Lithuanian or Jewish and Polish and so on, and one is a culture and an ethnicity. And then race, however, is made in the crucible of America because you could be Italian and Lithuanian and Polish and you come to America and in the crucible of race, that Italian identity, that Polish identity is pulverized in the crucible of race and remade as whiteness because we really can't tell. People don't begin to make those distinctions. Oh, you're from the northern part of Italy, from the southern part, of, right? And then with Poland and then you're Greek and then, you know, all of those resonant differences that make a difference when you're in Europe become less important when you come to America, so you lose the specificity of ethnicity, and race substitutes in a very bland and sometimes wan way, but it also, it also disallows a kind of serious engagement with this social construct called whiteness. Whiteness is a political identity. It's not something you're born with. 
you learn to become white. And you, you become white by breathing in the atmosphere of the society that, that lends certain significance to what that white identity is. And so many white brothers and sisters are resentful, rightfully so, of the ascription of group identity to them, and yet welcome to the world of black and brown and red and yellow people, welcome to the world of women, welcome to the world of many minorities in this country, and so, or throughout the globe. So I think it's extremely important for us to, to wrestle with that notion of whiteness, what it has meant, how it has operated, so that white brothers and sisters become conscious of it, and yes, get a grasp on it, begin to grapple with it, begin to interrogate it, be introspective about it, begin to talk about it in ways that are not defensive or nasty or vicious or putting down others or resentful, but calmly reflective about the existential and political identities that are ascribed to you, how whiteness has been an advantage for you. You know, some poor white people tell me, hey, you're a rich professor from Georgetown. Well, I'm certainly a professor from Georgetown. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's true. Thank you, uh, President DeJoy. I'm a rich professor from Georgetown. But the reality is, is that it ain't like Jackie Robinson's children got an exemption from Jim Crow because they were rich. It's not like Joe Lewis's family got an exemption. In other words, rich black people didn't get treated better than poor black people when it came to a white water fountain. So why is it now in the compensatory schema of justice that we say, well, it's not right that black people be heir to certain legacies of benefit and advantage because now you got more money? Because it was never about the dough. It was never about the cash. It was never about the money. It was about the pigment and the color and the culture and the race. And on the other hand, if you're a white person and you get stopped by the police and you don't die, that's the greatest white privilege in the world, at least in America, that you don't interact with a police person and you end up dead. Look, I was at, in, in front of Ben's Chili Bowl mm -hmm. a few months ago, and, you know, 4.30 in the morning, I was doing ethnographic study that night. <laughs> the bacchanalia of the clubs of D.C. Wondering what the young people were engaged in. Let me see myself. So I'm out there, 4.30, and a white kid is going off on the police. You, blank, 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 you, blank, blank, blank. And I said, oh, my God, they're going to shoot him. And then I said, no, he's a white guy. They're not going to shoot him. And this is what the policeman said. Now, son, you're clearly inebriated. You need to go home. All black folk are saying, can we get that? Just can we get that? Like, don't shoot us. Don't stab us. Tamir Rice, you roll up on me and within two seconds you have made a snap decision to deprive our children of life. That is the cumulative knowledge. That is the epistemology of, of fear. It is the projection of stereotype, of unconscious racial profiling on the body of a 12-year-old child. And so what we want is a cessation of the velocity of stereotype and a granting to us of the same humanity that you grant each other. And if we could have that, if white brothers and sisters could tell the truth about that, could grapple with that, I think we'd make a lot more progress in trying to grapple with what it means to be white.